how do we get our members mobilized for outreach when they don't want to be mobilized? If you're struggling with this, you're far from alone. Today we're going to look at one of the keys. It's the conversational approach. Culture has changed. Imagine we were 50 years back in time. You might find yourself walking down a street in a town or a city, and someone from a church might come up to you and thrust a little Christian booklet in your hand and say, excuse me, excuse me sir or madam, if you were to die tonight, where would you go, heaven or hell? And you might today look at that and think, man, that's really confrontational. But you know what, 50 years ago, the average person in the West believed in a God and a heaven and in a hell. But today, culture has decidedly changed because the average person doesn't necessarily believe in these three things. In fact, even where people might say they believe in a God, the majority of people would believe that all religions lead to God. In which case, the God they believe in and worship is quite different to the one that we worship as Christians. And all this has led many people in churches to become very skeptical of this thing we call evangelism. You see, they went to a church around about uh, 20 years ago and they learned what the gospel was and how to share it. Then they were to go out and, and share this with some other people. And at the end of it, their friends, having politely listened, say, hey, thanks for sharing that. I'm so glad you found what works for you. And the Christian has been left kind of stuck for words. And that was 20 years ago. And so here we are today trying to encourage them to re-engage in this. But they're kind of thinking this somehow just doesn't work. Now we could come back at them, for example, with Romans 1.16 and say, what do you mean it doesn't work? The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. We could look at other verses where it is the Holy Spirit who comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. If we share the gospel, the Holy Spirit can come in and do his work. But you know, the Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 that the God of this age has blinded the minds of non-believers so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The mind has been blinded by the God of this age and by the worldview that we have adopted so that people cannot understand the gospel because they know for a fact that all religions are the same, a fact, and therefore they know that we can't be right in what it is that we're saying. And so they are selflessly pleased we've found what works for us. You see, the question is, how do you tell the truth to someone who doesn't believe truth exists? Because this is our challenge. And the answer is very simple. You can't. Which begs the question, what can you do? And the answer is also very simple. You can talk with them about it. And this is the basis of what the conversational approach is about. Jesus, if we look at his methodology, he asked questions with an ear open to the Holy Spirit. Jesus' approach was a conversational approach and a Holy Spirit attuned approach. And what I wonder is if in our churches we need to get back to a little more focus on these conversation and, and listening skills. And that if we were to do so, maybe our evangelism equipping would begin to make more sense to our members. To give you another example, mastery in most things comes about as a result of first mastering the basics. About a year ago, I bought bicycles for our older two boys, then aged around about eight and six. We went out to a piece of flat footpath where they could practice riding the bicycles. And three things must you know if you want to ride a bicycle. How to pedal, how to balance and turn, and how to brake. And so I sought to teach them these things and they practiced until they could say, look dad, I can ride a bicycle. And then we decided to take them somewhere else. And I took them for a ride around a dirt pathway, around an estuary in the city that I live in. It's around about nine kilometers long. Now on one part of this bike ride, you have to come up behind a garage, and then you go back down a slight incline and turn onto the footpath, and then back onto this track that runs around the estuary. So as I came down this incline, I braked slightly to turn right onto the footpath, and boy number one rammed into the back of me and fell off his bicycle. Boy number two successfully swerved and did not ram into me. He ran right over top of his brother and also came off his bicycle and rolled he and the bike right onto the edge of the road. Now there were two rows of traffic going each way and some cars slammed on their brakes and one pulled over to help and I had two boys with, with bloodied knees. Three things must ye know to ride a bicycle. 
I don't need to teach my boys how to do skids on the back lawn, how to pedal and pull the front wheel up into a wheelie or a bunny hop or a jump. They need to know how to pedal, how to balance and turn, and how to brake. Now shortly afterwards, just for our amusement, uh, we had to stop because one of the boys, Ethan, was feeling too sore to bike any further. And it was then that I had a revelation. And I said, Ethan, if I was to give you a lollipop, would that help? And miraculously, both of my boys were healed. They were able to jump on their bicycles and ride no problem to the end of the bike ride to get their lollipops when we reached home. But my point here is very simple. Three things must ye know. How to pedal, how to balance and turn, and how to brake. But when I taught my boys these three things, they weren't interested in knowing how to brake. Because what use is braking when you don't know how to ride? And this is what it's like with evangelism training. If we make the core of our content, what is the gospel and how to share it? In a culture where many people in churches were getting this kind of training 20 and 30 years ago, they're disinterested in it because you can't tell the truth to someone who doesn't believe truth exists. An opportunity to share the gospel comes in the context of a conversation. An opportunity to share your testimony comes in the context of a conversation. What they need to know how to do is how to engage in non-threatening, two-way, spiritual conversation with a multi-religious person in a Western culture. How to engage in non-threatening conversation with someone who you would completely disagree with in terms of their religious worldview. So that through asking questions and keeping it relaxed, you can maintain and guide that conversation. Within that space, the opportunities come. And what we've found is that when our approach to training is like this, it makes sense to people in a Western environment. So the conversational approach, to break it down, four simple points. Point number one, remove the agenda of sharing the gospel from the front end of the conversation. This is to say, put it at the back end of the conversation or off to the side. If I'm passionate about football, I might attempt to bring football into every conversation I engage, but I'd only end up talking about it if the other person was really interested in football. And maybe this is what talking about spiritual things needs to be for us. And this whole point might sound like heresy to some because we must share the gospel. But just think about it for a moment. If you're nervous about sharing your faith and you come up to your friend and your palms are sweaty and you're twitching a bit because you kind of know that you're about to try and tell the truth to someone who doesn't believe truth exists, do you really think they can't tell? You're walking down a street, a salesman comes up to you. How long does it take for you to know that they're a salesman? One sentence? One word? Or you even just look at them? We live in the most media-saturated generation in human history. We see between one and 3,000 advertisements per day. And so do you really think people can't tell when we're coming with an agenda to share our little message about Jesus? And by doing this, what it means is that we can begin to engage non-threatening two-way spiritual conversations. The key to great conversations is great questions. And as we learn to engage with this, we will find that the opportunities are easier than we had thought. Because point two, we take a selfless interest in the other person and in their views. And because we've got no agenda, they can feel that it's relaxed. And we're free to ask things about spiritual stuff because it's no longer awkward because they can feel that we don't have an agenda. But then they're gonna say things that we disagree with. And so thirdly, what we do is we ask questions about what we don't understand. This is the way we deal with it. I'd like to give you three fantastic questions for this kind of a situation. What do you mean by that? Where'd you get that idea from? And have you considered? For example, they infer that all the religions are the same. So we decide to ask a question to investigate. What do you mean by that? What do you mean they're the same? In what ways? And they say, well, you know, they all say to love. So we ask, well, where did you get that idea from? And we begin to understand their religious background, whether or not they have one. And then we ask a third question, which is really a statement, but wisely worded as a question. And that is, are you aware that or have you considered? Are you aware that all the world's religions are actually majorly different in the major things? Like, some say God exists and some say God doesn't. I mean, they can't be both true at the same time, can they? And already, the person we're talking with may have begun to think in a different way and see that there could be a legitimate, different perspective to their own. And because questions beg questions, point number four, when the opportunity arises, share your thoughts gently and naturally. To give you one illustration, 
I had a classic conversation on an aeroplane. I sat down and the gentleman next to me and I introduced ourselves to each other. When he found out that I was involved in church work, he said up front, he says, I don't really want to talk about religion. And I said, no worries. We then proceeded to talk about his career because it was really interesting and was in the media at that point in time. About 10 minutes later, he said, what do Christians think about such and such? And I responded with a one sentence reply and then asked him a question about what we'd already been talking about because he'd just broken one of the rules of conversation. You don't just change topic in the middle of a, a great conversation. And so what do you think he did? He ignored my question and he immediately asked another question about Christianity and religion. And so it continued for approximately the next one hour of that flight. Everything in the gospel would have been communicated within that conversation and a whole lot of other amazing topics covered as well. Now let's analyze this simple conversation. When he said he didn't want to talk about religion, did that mean he didn't want to talk about religion? Well, clearly not. So what did it mean? It's possible that he was saying, I've met some of you Christians before and you've got your little message you feel you have to share. I don't want to be someone's target. Or maybe he was saying, I've had a hard week at work and really I just want a quiet plane flight. And when I said no worries, what was I saying? Well, I was saying no worries because I'd removed the agenda. I know I can't convert them. I'm just looking for the opportunities that are there. And so I respected his boundary and we had a great conversation. Then when he asked a question, what was he really saying? Was he asking that question? I think he was actually saying, you seem to be reasonably normal despite your religious job. Are you capable of a non-threatening two-way conversation with me about spiritual things in which you don't always have to prove yourself right and you don't have to say everything at once? And so when I replied with a one sentence reply, it was my intuition kicking in and just saying, dude, you can be in charge of this conversation. I'm fine with that. In which case, his unspoken response was, well, thanks, because I've got a stack of questions and I've been waiting for years to ask them. And this gentleman would have been in his mid-late 50s, and I hate to think how long he'd had them, and he'd been unable to find a Christian to have a sensible, open conversation with. The key to great conversations is great questions. We do need to know how to share our faith, but the sharing of the gospel or of a testimony takes place within the context of a non-threatening two-way conversation. We need to learn how to engage these. Like teaching my boys how to ride a bicycle. They want to know how to pedal, balance and turn. I know that they need to know how to break. So scratch where it itches. Members of our churches want to know how to engage a non-threatening two-way spiritual conversation with a multi-religious person. They want to know it's possible. They want to know that it's achievable for them because currently they don't think it is. And if we will focus on the conversational approach, They'll begin to ride that bicycle and then they'll realize they actually do need to know how to brake. And they'll work a whole lot of other things out for themselves beyond there. So if you've been struggling in personal outreach, I hope this helps. I've certainly struggled and, and I haven't known this stuff all along. I've learned this through trial and error and through mistakes. But if you're a pastor or a key church leader and your members don't really seem to want to become engaged as witnesses in their everyday lives, I'd encourage you that there have been some principles articulated here that could really make a difference. Please communicate these with your members and do so over an extended period of time to change the way that we think about evangelism. May the Lord make you effective in making your members effective.